15 go. Oh, they just go. Oh, they just ready. I'm ready. Welcome to Campus Party 2013. We are on the Galileo stage. And um, today, this afternoon, we have Wiede Hugenholtz giving you a talk on future technology, future and emerging technologies. The first half will be given, you to, given to you by Wiede, and the second half will be given to you by Viro Pekka. Now, without further introduction, I'd like to introduce you, Wiede. Round of applause, please. Hi, thank you. So my name is Wiede Hochnacht, I'm from Future and Emerging Technologies, and I'd like to share with you some of the things that we have been doing, the things that we're starting now, new things, and the way we're changing. Um, first, just to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, I will briefly mention Horizon 2020, that's the European program that we are a part of, then a part of that which is excellence in science, and Future and Emerging Technologies, which is again a part of Excellence in Science. And when I get to that part, I'll tell you how we work and what sort of things we do and some of the results that have come out of it. So first, what is Horizon 2020? It's a European research program for, uh, European program for research and innovation. Uh, it's gonna start in 2014 and it's gonna last for seven years. Um, and this is a very important part of European policies because it responds to our need to to innovate our way out of the crisis, to address a number of societal challenges, which is, for example, CO2 emissions, uh, healthcare, transport, and also to make EU a leading region in terms of research, science, technology. Um, and this is, in a sense, a big change because Europe has started with many programs. It's been gradually getting less. Now there's three. And as of next year, it'll be just one program, which also means one set of rules and a lot more simplicity. So I wanted to share this quote with you. This is a quote from Nelly Cruz, who said, we need to ask innovators what conditions they need to pursue their dreams. Now that's a quote about Horizon 2020. And I just wanted to let you know how that resonates with us in future emerging technologies. And it resonates very well because it, it reflects a lot of the things that we have been doing, such as, for example, a lot of grassroots experimentation. We do a lot of small projects with people who want to try something new. Uh, creating communities. Uh, we work with, let's say, building community around, around new emerging topics. Um, collective intelligence, sharing ideas and visions with others, and consultations. And a lot of it in the, in the center of this is risk taking because FAT is about high risk research. This is the structure of Horizon 2020. Uh, there's a, one pillar on industrial leadership. As you can imagine, that's about the technologies that the industry needs, such as ICT, uh, material science, nanotechnologies. There's one pillar on societal challenges, 
healthcare, um, transport, uh, uh, energy, for example. And then there is the excellence in science pillar. Now, from now on, I'm only going to be talking about the excellence in science pillar. So I will no longer talk about industrial leadership or societal challenges. So why do we have this excellence in science pillar? Well, it's because science, for in a sense, forms the basis of new technologies and you know, there, there is a certain ecosystem of long-term science, of long-term research that gradually brings up things that turn into more applied research and into innovation. Also, it is important for Europe to train new scientists, to have the best scientists, the best technologists in the world and to make sure that it's a place where these people want to work. And finally, Researchers need research infrastructures and making sure there is an access, that these infrastructures are there, that people have access to it is not a part of that pillar. So this is what is excellence in science pillar is made of. There's two Marie Curie actions, that's a, a career advancement grant, they give mobility grants to researchers. There's the ERC, ERC has been very successful over time. In fact, it's now become sort of a brand of quality. If you're a scientist, you want to brag, then you say that you, were, you got an ERC grant, you know. Um, this one part, research infrastructures, which does things like JR, making very fast access networks, um, giving access to very large computer facilities that, for example, allow you to do very big simulations, and of course, to very big data sets, access to, access to big data. And then there's FET, and FET sort of takes a special role in this because we sort of are the meeting place of science and technology. We, we are a place where new science ide scientific ideas get translated into technologies. So these are some, some aspects of FET, but before I go into that, let me just tell you the way I experienced it when I came to work at FET. I came there on the first day, they gave me a desk and a computer, and a colleague said, well, they were having this project, it was just finishing, they're gonna have a meeting to show what they'd done. And he said, why don't you come along, it was the next day. So I went to this building and it was this, in this room, they had a big, arena and it was full of cockroaches and the project had roboticists and chemists and biologists and roboticists were interested in making very small robots the chemists were working on pheromones which cockroaches use to communicate with each other and of course the biologists were interested in animal behavior and so they had made little robots which were equipped with pheromones so the cockroaches thought they were other cockroaches and these could mingle into this crowd of cockroaches and become accepted as a part of them and also influence the behavior of the other cockroaches by leading the way in some direction. Okay, so, well, as you can imagine, if you work at FED, you're never bored, I can tell you that. Um, so some things about FED, it's about higher risk. We tend to do, invest in that sort of research, which is higher risk, but if it succeeds, also has a high payoff. Um, then there is the beyond, being beyond what is widely known and accepted, very often, the ideas that don't fit anywhere else, that are too far ahead, or they don't, they don't belong into any of the existing categories, that sort of ideas end up at FET. The multidisciplinarity, we are very strongly believe that a lot of the great innovations now happen when one in discipline is inspired by things that are going on in other disciplines. And finally, as I mentioned, it has a bridge function. It bridges the excellence in science pillar to the societal challenges pillar to the Industrial Technologies Pillar. Okay, I'll just skip that one. So I don't know if you've ever seen this. This is the Pasteur Quadrant, and it sort of maps out research that is on a quest for fundamental understanding, and which is not, and those which are inspired by using, which is not. And there is, well, the fundamental research like Einstein, the applied research like Edison, but there's this special corner where you can find people like Louis Pasteur, where they do sort of pretty fundamental things, but inspired by still use cases, and that is where, where FET, FET sort of lives. So how is it built up? There are three different approaches within FET. One is Fed Open, and that is, an, as the name says, an open scheme which doesn't have any preset topics. They fund uh, projects um, which are just one idea which is being explored. And there is a second scheme, Fed Proactive, that sets a theme. We call on a particular deadline for that theme. And then we fund about five or six projects around that theme. They do their own thing, but at the same time, this allows sort of a community to grow. 
people often become interested in building up links also outside your project once the project is finished. And then there's a new scheme, which the, the other two we've been doing for many years, but there's a new scheme for flagships, which are very large projects which aim at a big goal which we will maybe only reach in 10 years from now. So I'll talk about these three in turn, but before I do that, I just wanted to mention a few things that are close to our heart. Uh, first, we believe in open access, so it's now a policy across our schemes that um, uh, publications from projects should become uh, openly available. Then there's citizen engagement and open science, engaging citizens in setting research priorities and carrying out the research. And I'm going to give you an example later on of how citizens can be engaged in, in scientific research and of course also sharing the results. And then there's research infrastructures, high performance computing. Of course we have projects that contribute to new generations of high performance computing but also a lot that need it in order, in order to carry out their research. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Fed Open. It's a scheme that does not have a preset topic. You can submit about anything you want. Um, it also doesn't have deadlines, so you can submit day and night. Over the framework program seven, they received about 3,000 proposals. And it's also a very light scheme. At this moment, you submit a 10-page proposal. And if it's funded, there are no deliverables. So they're pretty radical. And um, in Premium Program 7 also had specific actions for high-tech SMEs and for young researchers, and I'll give you an example of that as well. So I'll just give you a few examples. They funded over 140 projects in, in Framework Program 7, so unfortunately I can't tell you all of them, but there's just a few ideas of what sort of things you can see. Quantip was a, a project on uh, quantum information technologies, and they make one integrated microchip, which um, allows you to do quantum information process and quantum communication. They, have, they, they will make a single photon source and a single photon detector integrated into a microchip. And that allows you to do quantum information processing in a much more scalable and a much more stable way. And then this project everywhere, this involves the public in uh, doing sensing of, for example, the environment. So they give people small centers of, for example, uh, uh, polluting materials. Here you see a picture of London, which has been created by taking the data that people collect by carrying this around with them. It gives you the data, but at the same time, it also helps to make people aware of a problem and gets them involved. And then, as I mentioned, there were some special actions. The young researchers is one example. Uh, we'd noticed that a lot of the proposals we received tend to get written by professors which were in their 50s. And when it's accepted, they get some young people to carry it out. And these young people, well, they just have to do it. And they have all sorts of ideas of their own, but they can't, can't do anything with that. So we made a special scheme where we made as a requirement that all the people involved, all the, the main investigators, have to be young researchers. And this is such an example, Brainbow. What they do is they uh, make bidirectional interfaces. Uh, for example, if you're, a certain part of your body is paralyzed, then it's neuroprosthetic, which on the one hand feeds commands from your brain to that part of your body, but which also takes sensory experiences from that part of your body and feeds them back into your brain. Okay. I've seen uh, neuroprosthetics before, but this is actually the first time I saw that in a bidirectional way. Okay, so that gives you an idea of what Fed Open does. Fed Proactive looks for themes, looks for emerging areas, and then makes a call around that particular area that's with a fixed deadline and funds a number of projects around such an area. How do you find them? Well, in a, we find them in a bottom-up fashion. We look across the Fed Open projects that get submitted. Uh, we organize consultations with scientists. Um, we have sometimes small projects which investigate, explore new topics. And this picture gives um, an idea of all the different areas we had in FP7 and before. Every hexagon is one of these topics. I won't go through all of them, but it's, for example, chemistry-based IT, neuro-inspired ICT, quantum information processing. So many different upcoming areas, some of which have really come to establish themselves. And we'll give you just one example of a project that came out of uh, Fed Proactive. This is Socionical, and they wanted to make an app builder, which allows you to make an app to monitor crowds in uh, large-scale mass gatherings where many people gather 
for example, in a city. Okay? So they made this app builder and then they used it to make a first app for the London Mayor Show, which happened here in London some time ago. And what they do is you download this app onto your phone and you agree to also share your data of where you are with a central server. And of course, if you want to do that, you need to have some incentive. But in this case, there is an incentive because the people who walk around a city at the time, in this case London, they may be at an extremely busy square and they say, how do I get out of here? And they can actually in real time see a map where you can see where the crowd is moving. And they can see, oh, if I go over there, it's much quieter. Or they may come to that place and be looking for a very busy place. Same picture is also very interesting to the police because they have to manage these large crowds and if they see that everybody is gathering in a particular place, they want to, make, want to take some action. And it's also interesting to researchers, by the way, because they can use that data to publish many interesting publications. Okay, so this is something they did still while they were sort of in the investigating stage. Um, then they tried to set up a startup and they had a lot, a very hard time finding funding, especially because these wonderful funders always have many strings attached to their funding. But they managed to get f uh, a contract, surprisingly, from the Dutch police because in April this year, the Netherlands got a new king. And the inauguration of that king obviously drew very big crowds and the Dutch police actually paid them to make an app for this event. And here you see some statistics of the Amsterdam event and as you can see, tens of thousands of people used this app and uh, there were many, many logs, many people were using it at the same time. So you can probably ask the question, so what's different? What is different between a Fed Proactive project and a Fed Open project? And actually they're not very different. Um, the difference is that in, in Fed Proactive, they live in a ecosystem with a few other projects around them and they get build more contacts in that way. Okay, I'll skip this one. Um, and then, I'll tell you, Fed Open and Fed Proactive are things that we've been doing for many years. Um, but now we've started to do something new as well, which is Fed Flagships. We started a few years ago where we realized that there are some challenges which, which are so big that you cannot do them by a single team, you cannot do them in a single project. You really need to get hundreds of researchers all over Europe together and make them work together for about 10 years to, re to reach such a goal. So what we did is we went to the people that we work with and we asked them, um, so if you had a billion euros in 10 years, what would you do? And they came with many ideas and we sort of stimulated them to talk, to, to, to talk amongst themselves and to, to consolidate those ideas. And then we had a call where we called for such plans and we got 23 proposals. And we asked a whole group of scientists to, to select the best out of those and they selected six. And we let that six work out their plans for another year and we organized another evaluation. And then two were selected and that was in January this year. And those will now be launched as at flagships. Okay, this was announced in January this year by Nelly Cruz. And as you can expect, this led to hundreds of articles in specialized press, in the science press, but also in the general press all over the world. And I'll tell you a little bit about what these two flagships are going to do. Um, the first one is graphene. Graphene is a, a very peculiar material. It's a two-dimensional material, a single layer of carbon molecules. It's extremely strong. I've been told that if you would make a hammock for a cat from graphene, that that hammock would weigh less than one whisker of the cat. It's far stronger than diamond or steel, but it's also an exceptional electricity conducer, and it can has all sorts of potentials. Electronic paper, smartphones, can be used for new materials. And um, so Graphene is going to explore that, is going to build that and hopefully build up an industry in Europe based on that. Just wanted to show you this picture, which is the funding for Graphene over the past, two, over the past period. Um, the picture on the left top is sort of the, the national funding. And as you can see, all the countries are into it. But as always happens in Europe, it's very fragmented. And as you can see on the right side, it has been over the years increasing a lot because there's a lot of interest. Um, and on the bottom, you can see the European programs, they're also getting into it. But what I really want you to remember is this picture, which is um, the, the European, the, the, let's say the, the big European groups on graphene. It's a very fragmented setting. If we can make these work together and make them work as one in, uh, coherently in one direction, that would create an enormous, enormous thing. 
So this slide gives a few of the things that you might do with graphene. On the left you see a little video of a bendable screen. So it's a bendable display. Um, and it has all sorts of other potential things that you could do with it in ICT. Um, it can be used to make new composite materials. Um, aerospace industry is very interested in graphene because of being able to make very strong lightweight materials. Um, energy, uh, making supercapacitors, batteries for cars and so forth. And also healthcare, for example, uh, artificial retinas doing very fast, DNA very fast DNA sequencing, that sort of thing. So that's graphene, that's one, one flagship. And the second one is the Human Brain Project. And what the Human Brain Project wants to do is to make um, a simulation, a model of the human brain, a simulation of the complete human brain. Um, this is far beyond anything that, that has been possible so far. Also, at this point, it would still not be possible. So it is something that builds up to it, um, but which wants to realize that by the end of the project. Okay, Why the human brain? First of all, it is one of the major scientific challenges of this century. Okay, it's one of the big mysteries that we still face in science. Um, it would be a, a huge step forward to understand how the brain works. Next, it is also very important in terms of society. As our society is aging, we face more and more societal cost, especially because of brain diseases such as Alzheimer. And being able to recognize and deal with such diseases would be also er have a huge societal impact. And finally, uh, there is the possibility of making computers that are inspired by the brain, the way the brain works, because it works in a very different way than our current computers work. And I've been told that the brain works at about a banana a day. You know, to, to fuel your brain, it takes about a banana for a day. Imagine that you'd make a computer that would be able to do the same things that your brain can do and that would work on that amount of energy. It's completely mind-boggling. So what will the Human Brain Project do? It will, over time, create a number of platforms. What, they will, what these will do in particular is federate all the data that is out there, allow people to make models and allow people to run simulations based on those models. This will become stronger and stronger, bigger and bigger over time, until 10 years from now they will be able to do simulations uh, based on models with 10 trillion synapses. So 10 years from now, they will be using the state-of-the-art and high-performance computing at that time. And what does that mean for neuroscience? It means being able to publish a multi-level atlas of the brain, being able to simulate a mouse brain at first and a human brain. Also being able to control, for example, robots using such simulations. And most of all, and this is the most important thing, is it's a multi-level understanding of how the brain works at each of the levels, right from the gene level all the way up to the level of cognition. Okay. So this is more or less what I wanted to tell you about FET. Now, as you will realize, um, for us, we make this bridge between science and, and technology. So. How you make technology and where it goes is very important to us. So what we did is, um, just a few months ago in June, here in London, we organized a meeting with a lot of the people we work with and some of the people that we'd never seen before to ask them what, what should we do to strengthen what we can achieve in terms of, in terms of innovation. And uh, I've decided to share this presentation with my colleague, uh, Vera Pekka, who I'm going to invite on the stage in a moment. But I just wanted to share with you a few of the messages that we got on that event. Um, so one message we got is that if you want to exploit new opportunities, it's better to have an A team with a B idea than a B team with an A idea. Why? Because even if you have an A idea, by the time you set up a startup company and you get going, the world will have changed and it's no longer an A idea. If you have an A team, you can adapt. If you have a B team, you can't adapt. So. That's the most important thing. Then, assessing potential. A lot of the people that we work with tell us that many scientists, many technologies, do not realize the innovation potential of the things they're working on. So they said it's important that you get the people in place who are able to help you with assessing that potential. Then, there's our challenge to help people, sometimes to become an entrepreneur, 
if that's what they want, what courses they should follow, how the, what path they should follow, or sometimes creating the links because sometimes people don't want to become an entrepreneur, they want to stay a researcher, but they want to find one who can take their idea and take it further. Um, there was someone who told us, please make sure that we impose constraints. Why? Because if you have complete freedom, it's very hard to be creative. You need constraints to be creative. That's typically what causes creativity. So I'm not quite sure how to do that. It's kind of a challenge, but certainly we're going to work on that. And then the transition, and this is a challenge for us always, between people who are completely focused on publishing and people who are focused on making money. We very often work with scientists and they've been raised on the idea that life is about publishing. They just want to publish. That's the only thing they care about. And then there's people who want to make money. And getting those two to communicate is a big challenge because they fundamentally misunderstand each other. And finally, one final message we got is that if you want people to go for innovation, if you want people to give it a start, don't, don't go and offer them money. Instead, try to create a community that they can be a part of. Now, to take this further, I've asked a colleague of mine who knows much more about innovation to do a second part of this presentation. Vero Pack is going to tell you about all the things that we do for innovation. So I invite him on the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Vide, and uh, hi, everybody. Uh, to say that I'm excited to be here, it's, it's really an understatement. I uh, think from five or six o'clock I could not sleep anymore. So I'm, I'm really, really... Uh, great to be here uh, and to talk about uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, something that, I, that I'm, really, I'm really passionate about. And I would like to think that you are too, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Uh, but let me, um, let me start with a question. How many of you are or would like to be an entrepreneur? Well, to be honest, I, ex I, I expected a bit more hands... <laughs> <laughs> raised, but uh, what do you think this figure represents? It's of course a percentage and is related to entrepreneurship. Anybody, any idea? Sorry? Not, not really? Anybody else? At, at give it a try? Well, I will help you there. That's the percentage of, on average of people in Europe that answer yes to the question, who would like to be an entrepreneur, right? Now, we can debate if it's good or bad. I don't know what, what you think. But in 2009, this number was much higher, right? So we, in, in the years, Due to the crisis, this went down from 45% to 37%, right? So that's, that's, that's quite, uh, I would say, worrying. But also, if you look where we are compared with our main competitors, you know, like US and China, I think we have some catch-up to do. So for me, really, a question that I, I would say is it's, it's almost every day is how can we in European Commission can encourage more entrepreneurship in Europe, and I would say high growth entrepreneurship. If you have some ideas, I would definitely will be uh, welcome you and, and uh, to share with, uh, with me, and who knows, perhaps they might get implemented, and for sure you'll be very proud about that. But let me go a bit more into detail. Let's say we are looking at a digital entrepreneurship strategy around this this axis about digital single market access to finance skills and in the middle if you want ecosystem today i would like to give you some information some detail about what are we are doing in my unit to improve the ecosystem for entrepreneurship but just for your information and illustration uh, digital single market are things like uh, for example telecom single market or a more common set of ipr rules and if we uh, ask entrepreneurs what are their main barriers and why they go to US, for example, their top two is lack of digital single market and lack of access to finance, which in the US is, of course, or unfortunately, much better. Um, skills are also, are also mentioned and, and more and more as 
whether entrepreneurship skills or digital skills. But again, today I would like to concentrate on ecosystem and to give you some detail about the, how we support clusters, accelerators and incubators so that they can go from a local to a more European dimension and offer you better services. So for example, if you have an idea and would like to start up a company, they could mentor and, and support you. Uh, also, uh, legal advice, because uh, legal advice is, was, for example, in the study that was done by Telefonica said that 12% of entrepreneurs said that they need legal advice and so on. So this is just a list of projects where we are supporting accelerators, names like, that you know, like Vira. Uh, like uh, App Campus, like uh, Startup Spain, like Beta, Beta I. Uh, we are supporting them to, me to network with, with, with themselves so that they improving their services and are able to provide you better services. Um, also, we are supporting some incubators in a specific domain, in this case, help, health. Um, European Commission, in, for example, in the FP7, is funding around 1 billion, 1 1.1 billion of ICT research. Now, some of this research, if not most of them, has great results. What we have noticed is that a lot of them are remaining in the lab or are published, as Widow was saying, instead of being, you know, put in, into the market, whether by an SME or startup, a new company, whatever. So one of, of, my, of our and, and, and my unit uh, uh, focus will be how to connect the, re the researcher with entrepreneurs. For example, by developing investment readiness for participation in, uh, participants in ICT programs or by putting them in contact. So if you have a researcher and if he comes in contact with entrepreneurs, perhaps they might, you know, like each other or the, the researcher might get infected from the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, or who knows, perhaps the entrepreneur might see, wow, this is a great result. There, there is a big market out there. You know, you never know what it is. Talking about the, 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 the legal advice. This, we all know that, that this, this costs money. And for example, if you have a, a question related to IPR, it's quite a specialized task. In the same time, the, 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 the students are not always prepared to, f to integrate very quickly in the labor force. And, and so we decided to put these two problems together and make it an opportunity. So in uh, iLink, what we have, it's a network of four uh, leading universities in Europe that will put on one hand students in the last year together with, a, with an experienced professional and they will give what they call pro bono advice. That means for free to you if you want to set up your company or, or, or you have, if you have a, a, a question, but not, you know, how do I set a, set a company in the country X? That that's already exists quite. A bit. Now, another, another support activity that we are doing in the unit is investment forums. And I would like to tell you about two of them you might be interested. The, one, the first one is in Nantes and will be in October uh, this year. And the period of registration is open. So if you just are, uh, you have, um, let's say, an idea or a startup in the network electronic media domain, you might want to apply. You know, just Google for Name Investment Forum and you will end up on the registration page where you would provide some details. And if your idea is good, then you will go to, to Nantes uh, for free and have the chance to be coached and pitch in front of 10 investors. So think about that. Another, uh, the second one is about, it's an entrepreneurship and investment forum that we will organize in Vilnius in a nice 2013 events. Again, uh, you will, will support you to go there for free entrance and so on. We'll have even a demo area. Um, we will soon open the registration for that one. So if you are interested or you know somebody that's interested, don't hesitate to, to tell them about that. Um, now, okay, all this, it's already quite some information now. Where will you find this now and in the future? Well, I'm really excited to say that we will we wa we'll develop a, a single point of com or single sh shop 
on the website that you that you see in front of you for the moment is starting and the address you can hopefully easy remember startup um, europe.eu and there you will find all the news and more and more resources all these projects that will contribute to this website if you have a question you will have you will find the place to put this question online to the iLink uh, project and to get the answer after one or two days. The same if an accelerator open a uh, call for expression of interest, in other words, uh, to receive proposal from the startups, you will also find it on this website. Now, my colleague um, Wide told you a few things about uh, Horizon 2020, the new framework program that will integrate both research and innovation and of course um, I want to focus a bit on the innovation instrument the things that you might if you have an idea whether it's a result or just a, a business idea and you might want are looking for support to bring it to the market what can European Commission offer um, you see the, you have seen this quote from 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 Nelly Cruz which is a is a really big supporter of entrepreneurs and 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 youth, and you've seen how this resonates for uh, for FET. I will show you in the next slides how this resonates for innovation. What does it mean m uh, reaching to non-traditional actors and more bottom up? Basically, it means also reaching out to entrepreneurs and startups, which till now are not, let's say, participated in bigger numbers in our projects because they were more research, so, so more farther from the market. But um, I would like to, to spend the next two slides introducing you Open Disruptive Innovation Scheme and SME Instrument. Now, our, um, our strategy for entrepreneurship has two components. One of them is about the startup phase. The other one is more on the growth phase. Now, the ODI or Open Disruptive Innovation has several phases. The first one of them is position to support the startups. Basically, if you have an idea that, is, that has potential, you can receive up to 50,000 euros for a period of, let's say from three to nine months, can be up to a year, to test that idea, to do a small prototype, to do a feasibility study, and so on. Now, if you have a more mature idea, or you, the, the results of the first phase are, are more than positive, then you can go in a growth phase where you could receive between 500 and 2 million euros for a period of maximum two years, so one to two years, to really bring that idea to the market. And we are talking here about really high potential ideas that, that have not a national or a local potential, but a European and international potential. So really big, big ideas. And you would get this money, I would say, in hopefully quite a easy, quite a easy way. But let me explain a bit how we position that. Because we need to be very, very selective. These are serious uh, money and the serious competition. So you might be familiar with uh, Clayton Christensen, uh, let's say, uh, disruptive innovation, whether in an existing market or in new markets. This is the type of innovation that we want to focus. Innovation that has a high risk, you've seen it before, but also high societal and commercial impact. We'll use three evaluation criteria, excellent innovation, disruptive impact, and fast implementation. We are not talking here about three, four years. We are talking on average around one year, maximum two years, for phase two. The phase one is, like I mentioned, on average six months, three to nine months uh, on average. Now, a bit more detail about this new instrument. You might have heard about SBIR. Anybody heard about SBIR? Small Business Innovation Research? No? US? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a very, I would say, successful scheme that is applied in the US for quite some years and has produced really big companies like Qualcomm, for example, where they received 
support in a similar fa fa fashion, phase one, small amount of uh, 15 to 50,000 US dollar in that case, positive evaluation, and then they go for second phase. Well, in the H2020, for the first time, this instrument, what we call SME instrument, of course, we cannot call it beer, right? <laughs> uh, will be implemented. So, and this is targeted just for SME. I mean, just to, to give you some ideas about how a sea change this is. Till now, we had only collaborative projects. Minimum three, but sometimes 10 participants. Um, SMEs were not that many involved, etc., from, from different countries and so on. No, SME instrument, if you are a single SME, a single startup, you can apply. I mean, you don't have to bother to search for, for other partners from three other countries. No, you are alone and you have a good idea, you can apply. And you don't need to write hundreds of pages. For the first phase, we will go for 10 pages. 10 pages, 10 pages, good idea, gets 50K, right? The second phase, 30 pages, of course, right? We are talking about a different amount, but still, 30 pages, not... Today, in one of those projects, the shortest proposal is 80 pages. The longest one is 246 pages. It's it's a problem for me to understand what is this proposal about, right? So here we are talking about 10 and 30 pages. That's it. So this is definitely this is definitely a change, a huge, huge, huge change. And my message to you is, well, most probably till now as an entrepreneur, as a student, you haven't thought too much about Framework Program 7, as innovators at least. But if you, f you, sh you should think about Horizon 2020, really. If you are an innovator, you should get involved. Search for the information, is there. The call will open at 1st January 2014, in four months. You will have all sorts of calls. But the one that I tell you is always open. That's another, I would say, revolution. This was for FET, for FET Open, it was there. But for other calls, that was the only one. Now you will have it for SBIR. So you can, when you have your idea, you just submit it. Ten pages and that's it. In maximum four to five months, in four, three to four months, we will evaluate it. And then we will, if you are successful, we'll sign the contracts. But now the average is one year. Okay? Now we wanted to reduce it to six months. So... Really, you might want to, to consider to search for information for H2020 and, and get involved and come with great ideas. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have, so, if you have any questions, myself and my colleagues are more than, hel than happy to answer. Just hold on, there is a question. Hi. Um, so y you mentioned you support accelerators and incubators. Are they mainly just ICT digital? Yeah, indeed, okay. indeed. Is there any, um, there's not really much infrastructure out there for um, healthcare companies or, or chemical companies producing things like quantum dots or, or novel technologies like that? Is there, any, is there any push to go support those type of entrepreneurs? Which, which type? Once you make um, novel chemicals or materials, not directly related to digital or ICT. Yeah. Well, I have to, uh, to admit that uh, I will ask this question to my colleagues from DGRTD. As far as I know, the accelerator and incubator are mostly in the technology domain. Yeah. Whether if it's strictly ICT or web, I think these are the most popular, or digital, that means applying or using ICT to improve processes in, in whatever. That, these are the ones that are, that are known, and what we have seen with the, with the, even with the study from Telefonica, these have boomed in the, last, in the last five years, even during the crisis. I'm not aware, to my shame, but I will, I will, I will ask with the colleagues in RTD if, they are, if there are or, su or they are indeed support this kind of entrepreneurs, uh, sorry, of accelerators in, uh, in life sciences, for example, or, or whatever. I think it's quite rare, actually, that there is that kind of support. That, uh, that, that's, a, that's a good observation. Thank you very much. That might, we might give them uh, an idea so that they would support that because that means there is a market failure and they might want to support that. Thank you very much.
Hi, um, I'm a scientist myself, and I was just wondering, do you think bioincubators and uh, these kind of accelerator incubator schemes are going to be the end of kind of traditional tenure academic science as we know it, and publishing maybe, you know, old-fashioned journals, whether that's going to be obsolete and we're just going to get into kind of a, a more um, entrepreneurial looking at science? If you want to, okay. to answer. Um, I think on the one hand, um, this has the, the, the whole model of publishing papers and evaluate people in that way. Um, is, it's a fact of life in science and I think it will be for some time. But at the same time, we're seeing a lot of new models, especially in terms of open science. Um, some companies stop doing research themselves and say, we'll just buy it in when we need to or they source it out. They say, here's a problem we want to see investigated and they make a contract with some other company to, to investigate it for them. Um, and also, if you look, for example, in the things we're looking at in terms of open science, there's a lot of things are changing, but at the same time, I think at this point it is, it is at least for me, not, not possible yet to say which way this will go. I mean, I've, I've seen, for example, ideas for making um, uh, a social network type um, uh, website for scientific publications where you don't publish in a journal, but it's sort of evaluated through a social network, things like that. There's a lot of ideas out there. I know a lot of people who are thinking about this and who are thinking about alternative options. But I think it's at this point, to me, it's too early to tell which way things will go. If I can, if I can add to that, the accelerators and incubators are not the only model. If you, they apply a very competitive, you know, innovation funnel. They select only a certain percentage of them, and they. You know, they, they mentor and they have a certain, a better success rate than all the others. But definitely that's not the, the, only, the, the, the only way to go. You can, if you, if you think that you have enough, uh, let's say, um, information, knowledge sources and you have a co-founder, you can start up the company yourself and try to, try to pitch, to participate, to invest from forums and so on and so on. So these are, you know, in parallel. These are in parallel in, uh, in U.S., there are very successful university like like you have seen this this morning where 25 50 percent even uh, of their students are starting a company and and and, and a, a high percentage get funding they don't need necessary accelerator of course the, the the accelerator model comes from us but it's not is not the the only one they are all part of the of the ecosystem there might be other other uh, you know resources to get to get support that's that's for sure for example uh sme instrument that's that's for sure Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you get a round of applause for our speakers? Thank you. Thanks. Next up, we have Tim Harper at three. So in about 10 minutes, Tim Harper will be on stage. Thank you very much.
Uh, you just tune out, don't have any sound on your presentation at all.